Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents, and now your host, Paul Leslie. Our special guest is Tana Frederick. She's joining us to talk about her life in acting. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. The pleasure is all ours. Who is Tana Frederick? At heart, I'm probably a farm girl from Iowa who, who's constantly searching for for inspiration and inspiring other people and receiving inspiration from other people's good deeds and, and work and, and brilliance. And so, I don't know. That one, gee, nobody's ever started an interview out with that question. I can't believe it, but they haven't. <laughs> I came from Iowa. I moved out to Los Angeles after graduating from college. I have been living out here in Los Angeles since 99 and uh, making independent films and working on a nonprofit and, and working on some projects in Iowa and trying to give back to the people who I, I really believe inspired me to become the person that I am. And I guess that's who I am. What was life like growing up in Iowa? It was great. It was really, really very nurturing, artistic environment for me to grow up in. I started doing children's theater in fifth grade, and we had we had great musical programs. Our the town that I'm originally born and raised in is Mason City, Iowa, but it's more commonly known as River City from the Music Man. Uh, Meredith Wilson had come to Iowa and founded a great musical program there, and the Music Man musical was based on my hometown, and it was very rich in music and art and uh, forward-minded thinking, and so I ended up doing four or five shows a year as a as a kid, starting at, the, at age eight on at this great children's theater and doing choir and competing in classical piano around the state. And it was it was just a very supportive place to grow up. And, and I started making films, too, with my dad's camera when I was probably sixth grade. was when we got our first video camera. And I would go around the neighborhoods and, and make I have a ton of films that I would never, ever show anybody because <laughs> I don't know what kind of plot we were coming up at at that age, but they were... They really didn't have much of a, a character arc or, or plot point to any of them. But we went around and all the parents would let us film in their houses. And it was just a really great, great, wonderful place to grow up. Early on, can you remember specific plays, perhaps, that made a big impression on you? Yeah, absolutely. I, d- I, don't, I think there's something I took from just about every single show. The first play that I was really, really excited to do was Little Women play the role of Amy. I was in fifth grade, and there were older girls in it, teenagers who played, the, and then a the woman who played the role of the mother. And it was my first big leading part, and that was a very significant significant role for me. It felt very... I just remember being able to sort of dissolve into that world and dissolve onto the stage and the audience and the lights and just feeling sort of that it was my home and feeling more comfortable there than I felt in my own life. And from there on, I did shows, did a lot of shows, Miracle Worker, Guys and Dolls, different different great creative plays. And like I said, as much as I could possibly get my hands on. Then I went to the University of Iowa and had great experiences with the playwright program and the writing program there and working with a lot of writers experimenting with their style and their form and, and their writing and I really enjoyed being part of the playwrights program because it's it's a lot like film. You know, Iowa University of Iowa has one of the leading writing programs on the nation and their playwriting program is equally strong and some great people have come out of there, and, uh, including Tennessee Williams, funny enough. Working to develop a play is a lot like with a new playwright is, is a lot like filming a movie where you're constantly searching out who the character is with the director and the writer and you're constantly trying to figure out you're constantly shaping the piece as you as you work on the piece so that was a really great facility for me to learn from was, was at the university of iowa 
It was interesting the second ago when you mentioned you feel even more comfortable on stage than in your own life. Yeah, I always have felt that, actually. I feel that's why it was really hard to answer the question, who, who am I exactly, because I've always felt more like the characters that I play and that I know them more thoroughly inside and outside than I do myself. I kind of I feel like the moments between the shows that I do, the films that I do, or the, or the theater that I do, the moments in between are kind of devoid of any personality. <laughs> But I'm sure many actors feel that way, or maybe they don't, I don't know, but I, I definitely feel that way, that, that those in-between times of not finding a character. Just because I've been doing it for for a long time, are less definitive than those where I'm on stage and the lights with an audience playing playing a character. I, those, the, the characters for me are more real than life is, is for me. How did you come to know of the director, Henry Jaglum? I was rehearsing a play out here that was written by one of my fellow graduate students at the University of Iowa, and I begged him for the role in it because it is hard to break into LA theater, and it was my second year out here, and this gentleman came, a fellow actor came to the to rehearsal and said he had shot with Henry Jaglum on Going Shopping, Henry's movie Going Shopping, that same day, and, and this actor was just all lit up by Henry's work, and, and couldn't say enough wonderful things about how amazing Henry is and, and amazing his process is and the freedom that he uses and, and how he's the most ingenious director out there. And and I said, well, how do I work with this, this guy? I had no idea who, who Henry was and hadn't seen any of his movies. So he let me a copy of Henry, De- Henry Jaglum's Deja Vu, and I watched after late, rehearsal around late that night. I went home. I watched Deja Vu, the opening credits of Deja Vu, and then didn't have time to write more because uh, to watch more because I because I needed to write a letter to hand deliver to Henry that next day because my friend said he was casting a movie. So I wrote this really long three page college thesis single space letter to Henry about how brilliant Deja Vu was and I had to work at one of my restaurants the next day, so I hand delivered that letter to Henry, not really expecting anything. And then Henry ended up calling me and talking to me about how much he loved the letter and how perceptive I was and how how well well understood he felt from my letter. And we we began doing theater and, and film projects. I think a year later, after working with each other. And then I, I, w- I wasn't able to actually confess to Henry, now having seen all of his films many, many times because of the Catholic guilt of, of having written that letter <laughs> and not actually seeing the film, I've, now I'm very, I confessed to him, I think it was maybe like two films and three plays later, you know, I hadn't really seen your movie when I first wrote you that letter. And he thought it was, which is very good, he thought it was great that I had written that and that I had the hospital to go and write that letter and, and try to get my foot in the door with him and he thought it was very funny. He's very pro pro actor, pro actor struggles in, in Hollywood and and so I he wasn't offended, which is thank God for that. <laughs> when you met him, what was your first impression? I was really surprised because he was really he was revered as this very Orson Welles director. Very serious indie, you know. He it just felt like everybody had this sort of masculine attitude towards the importance of a Henry Jaglum film. And he invited me to a screening, and I had never met him in person. And I remember showing up at the screening, and this delightful man kind of danced up to me in this hat and these little moccasins cute little moccasins, and I just remember how sort of magical I, I looked into his eyes, and he was, he was very magical, very playful, sweet little kid, and almost like a ballerina, and that was Henry, and I was able, and I just kind of started laughing because I was so shocked that I, I had expected him to, to be this, this serious uh, independent director, and he was very childlike, sweet, playful, and was kind of a joy in his eyes, a real sweet joy in his eyes, and I can remember that, his feet, his sort of dancing feet, and his 
sparkly joy that you carry with them. The website is just 45, the number 45, from Broadway.com. It was a play first, and now it's a film. Tell us about how you became involved with just 45 minutes from Broadway. I had worked with Henry on probably probably five plays and probably more, probably six. <laughs> I don't remember, but I was, but we, and we filmed four films together and I was used to working on his material. I really liked working, uh, I really love working on Henry's stage material. I mean, his, his theater, his theater work is, is, as a playwright is, I think very, very profound and lovely and fresh and very different voice than a very unique voice to any other playwright that I've heard. And like I said, coming from the University of Iowa and being very familiar with the all the playwrights that, that I studied there, he has a wonderful, amazing verbiage and sort of flow to his work. And his ideas of the characters are so beautiful. And there's a sort of hopefulness to, to his plays. So I wasn't doing a play at the time. And, and we, we kind of, I've, I've been really, I, I try to, do a film and then a, a theater piece and then a film and a theater piece because I, I really feel like that is what keeps me on my toes as far as the learning curve of acting in theater is switching off between having a live audience there and not having a live audience, having a crew there. It's, it's really important, I feel, to merge those two worlds for me anyway, for my process, to merge those two worlds and be consistently up against each of those worlds and be able to craft the character around both of those mediums. So anyway, we had finished shooting a film and I said, let's do it, let's do a show and why why don't you try to write it? And I was going to the to my film festival in Iowa that um I had began a couple of years earlier and I said, you know, my favorite film of yours is Last Summer in the Hamptons, which is my favorite film in the century, and uh, I love the the sort of message behind you can't take it with you. The 1930, I think it's 1939 film, um, which is with Jimmy Stewart, which was just beautiful and um, quirky and, and great. And so I said, just, can you combine those two kind of themes and see what you come up with? And Henry was up to the challenge and. I didn't really believe that he would have anything when I when I got back from from Iowa. But funny enough, he had an entire like an entire first draft of a play finished when I when I got back from the festival, and and that had come over the course of a week and a half. And it was a beautiful play. The characters were distinctly carved out. The the characters were wonderful, and it was a great concept behind it. And so. We started to put it up on its feet, and people loved it, and we ran for a year in Los Angeles, and then, of course, people kept saying to Henry, this needs to be your next movie, and so we adapted it into, he adapted it into a screenplay, and we shot it, and it's out currently out in art house theaters across the country. You play the character Pandora Isaacs. How did you build that character? Mostly copied Henry. <laughs> he um, kind of... I think it's your responsibility as an actor to sort of, not your responsibility necessarily, but I feel it's a nice thing. I feel that there is something, uh, there's a lot of a playwright within each character that you play, and what is that, what what side of that playwright and that playwright's life, what sort of cathartic moment is that playwright writing the play for and putting the character through? Why is the character going through what they're going through, and how does the playwright have access to that information? And so... With Henry, I'm familiar enough with his life and his um, who he is and his relationship to his brother, who is not an artist whatsoever. There's a relationship in the in just 45 minutes from Broadway, the movie and the play. There's a relationship between an older sister and a younger sister. And I play the young, younger sister, Panda, and my older sister, Betsy, is a real estate agent, whereas I'm an actor. And that conflict was very heavy in Henry's life growing up with his parents being in business, father and his brother, and him being an artist. And so I was able to draw on a lot of I was able to draw on a lot of that, that childhood experience of the frustration of not being able to com- communicate with, with your sibling because they just think of you as a as a 
as a duck and they're a goose because you do something completely different than what they do as a profession. And that it was, it was mostly with research with Henry for this character. Was this your first time working with Judd Nelson? Yes. Yes, it was. It was, yeah. It was amazing. It was amazing. He's a great, great, great actor. He's a real sweetheart. He's a real sweetheart of a man. Really, really bright. I mean, really, really smart. Smart fit. And I would wanted to work with him for a long time because I really loved, I looked up to his emotional vulnerability and the work that he had done um, in films prior to, you know, Breakfast Club, of course, is, is given, but, but his other, his other work too, and, and I really wanted to, I, I thought that that would be really a good match for Henry's style of, of filming with the, with 45 minutes, and he fit that character, and so I really pushed, pushed him on Henry, and, uh, had Judd do a play reading with me and Noah Wiley of another film of Henry's, so that, um, Henry could see, I sort of, I sort of get these men to, to get in front of Henry by, by doing play, play reading from them. Because Henry can then, he writes from the characters that he knows, so he'll, he'll tweak the characters according to whoever is playing that role. And that's always how he casts his projects. And so he got Judd Nelson in front of him early enough to where, although Judd didn't play the, the role on, on, Stage, Judd was great in the film with it. There's a forthcoming film that you're going to be in, The M Word. Tell us about that. Uh, it's a really wonderful. It's one of Henry's women's films. He he loves two subjects. He loves theater families and he loves he loves women and women's issues. He's very close to his mother and spent a lot of his childhood talking about listening to women talk about their problems as women, and these were all sort of upper socioeconomic housewives that had very real problems, though they didn't have jobs or kind of a struggle for money. They had very real emotional pain, and Henry was sort of thrust into that because his mother didn't have a daughter, and so he spent a lot of time listening to them, and thus came his love of making these films about women's issues. He's been eating baby fever, going shopping. And this was, this is, this is, is a, a very funny, funny, funny movie because I'm watching it being edited right now about menstruation, menopause, and men. And Frances Fisher plays my mother in it. She's a genius, comp comedian. She's so Lucille Ball. And Michael Imperioli from The Sopranos who played uh, Christopher Moltisanti in The Sopranos. He plays the leading man, my love interest. And also, uh, Corey Feldman is in it and gives a surprisingly brilliant performance in this in this film. And we had a wonderful time shooting it. I We, we had, mm, like, 60 women on the set because Henry does a series of interviews when he does these women, his sort of women's issues films. He does a series of interviews about the women and about how them talk about the subject directly into the camera, which is a really great, I think, device to use before there was reality TV. This is a device that Henry used to sort of bring honesty into into the films and think bring intimacy to the audience members who were going in and out of a plot at, with these interviews. And so there were about 60 women on our set who were going through menopause, getting hot flashes all at the same time. And they, nonetheless, we were, everybody was able to laugh about it and talk about it. I mean, menopause is something that not a lot of, not a lot of women talk about. I think there's a certain shame that's affiliated with it and certain questions that, that come to light about, about menopause. And my mom never talked to me about it. I know very little about it except after shooting this film. Now I know what I have to look forward to, but it's, it helps, it's very therapeutic, I think, for these, for women to look at, at other women going through the same situations and be able to laugh. I mean, that's a very wonderful, seductive way of coping. And with menopause, there's all these wonderful, amazing, gorgeous women who are going through menopause. And my character is kind of the kid, like, watching her aunt and her mother go through this and trying to help them through it. And it's a very funny, funny film. And... 
without being in your face sort of condescending about the issue. Instead, it, it kind of, you laugh along with the women and you, it's, it's going to be, I cannot wait for this movie to come out because it's really going to be a lovely breakthrough, I think, in, in the subject of menopause and how often it's talked about. Tell the listeners out there about the Iowa Independent Film Festival. Um, the Iowa Independent Film Festival is a festival in Mason City in Clear Lake, Iowa, where I started it seven years ago with Dick Shino, who's uh, Richard Shino, who lives there and pretty much runs the festival single-handedly now. It's a beautiful, wonderful festival, and it's been a delight to have to have the festival and see all of the wonderful filmmakers or people in the in the community who have been inspired by by filmmakers who have come in from other parts of the Midwest and other parts of the country and made these films for 5000 3000 10000 15000 dollars for a budget and made great beautiful films there it's a really different world out there now because of the the technology available for filmmakers people can now rent or buy very cheap cameras really use their creativity and create great pieces of, of work that that are potentially going to be a huge hit in the world market, film market. And we we're seeing that happen more and more and more. And so the, the film festival has been very important to me because I've been watching a lot of people from the, the, computer, the community that I felt was so supportive. I've, I've watched a lot of budding artists come out of there and start to win uh, awards and get some um, national recognition and feel permission to make films because they have a venue to play it. Like I said, we don't we don't have a, an art house theater. The, the closest art house theater in North Iowa is either three and a half hours south or two hours north. So you take your pick either way is a long drive to see a movie. And it's better with now with Netflix and iTunes and all that good stuff. But if you want to go see an indie film on a, on a big screen, there's not lots of venues for that. So the Iowa, the Iowa Film Festival provides a place for Midwesterners, not only Midwesterners, to play their films that they've made if they make the cut. Through the, we, we get a lot of submissions now. We, we get, uh, I think we had like close to 600 in our last festival. But they have a place and a venue and an audience to watch their films and People from the East and West Coast have a great audience. You know, it's a state where the first caucus is held, so people will voice their opinions and they will be opinionated and they will uh, about about these these people's films. So some people will bring some some filmmakers will bring a first cut or a second cut of their film to the Iowa Film Festival and and grow the audience for for feedback, kind of like they do with presidential candidates. It's a great film festival. It's a great place to. to it's been a great place to birth new artists, and it's been a great place for filmmakers to come and hear very educated and open and, and wonderful opinions about their what they're trying to, to the end product they're trying to create, or if they're showing their end product to should have an audience that's going to appreciate it. Would you change anything about your journey thus far? Hmm, I don't think so. <laughs> I. I don't think even if I chose to go back and change some of the things, given all the circumstances and where I was at at the time, that I would make any different choices than what I made. And in that sense, I try not to be a could have, would have, should have type person, and I try to move forward and look at all of the diversity and adversity that is part that I've part you know, has part taken in my life and, and use that with characters and with on film and on screen and with new movie ideas and I I find that to be much more helpful than, than going back and saying I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done that or I wish I would have changed this. I and I I'm just not very good at at going back and, and saying I would have changed something. I think I'm I'm too far too stubborn and proud. <laughs> to say I would I would have changed or done something differently. I think if I hadn't, you know, if I hadn't come out, if I hadn't had a college education and the confidence of that when I came out to Los Angeles, I would have had a very different career. 
and I graduated from the University of Iowa as valedictorian of my liberal arts class. I graduated with a poli-sci degree, international relations emphasis, and a theater degree, and honors in both, and so at my graduation, and the only thing I would say is I would, you know, if, if I was able to come out to L.A. earlier, which I wanted to do, but my parents stressed the importance of education and said, you must go to college, and if I hadn't gone to college, I think a lot, and, and come out here younger, I think, uh, you know, because Hollywood is somewhat of an age game, which I, I also try to kind of ignore that, but I think if I had come out without, without an education, college education, I wouldn't have probably been able to maneuver myself in, in certain situations and, and be as, as keen on, on certain opportunities and projects that I otherwise would have said. What is the best thing about being Tana Frederick? <laughs> These are very bored questions. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess having great parents, I would have to say. <laughs> my, I'm really lucky to have the parents that I have. And that's probably the best thing about being myself is, is, is the two people who raised me and the care and the time and the concern and, and the support that they gave me. My parents are I was very lucky to, to have been born with two amazing, wonderful parents. And that's the best thing about being me. My last question is very open-ended. <laughs> For anyone who's listening to this broadcast, what do you want to say to the oh. listeners? <laughs> oh, what do I want to say to the listeners? Wow, that's very open-ended. You're right. I would definitely say follow your heart, not your head. Just a little bit. I follow your heart and your head, but follow your heart a little bit more in in what you want to achieve and accomplish, and and what you need to put out there in life emotionally, and sh and show no fear. Even if you're scared, dive into everything as if it were the last day of your life, and and drink drink life to its fullest. I think that even though that's a very open-ended question, I think those are the kind of two general actions I live my life by, and that's what I would have to say I would like to impart on other people, and is just encourage them to live life fully and freely and completely, and if, if you are scared of something, conquer it. <laughs> I mean, if you are scared of something, that, that's a good sign that you're supposed to be doing that, and you're supposed to be going in that direction, so go after the scary parts of life. Thank you so much for this interview. You've been very open. You may ask very open questions. I love it. Thank you for asking very specific, straightforward questions. It really has been, honestly, the, the most straightforward interview I've given, which is great. I love it. Thank you so much. Our special guest has been Tana Frederick. You can find out more information about her online, tanafrederick.com. Thanks so much. Thank you. What a great interview. That was a joy. 